Well, Louis, I'm afraid I've made what I think is technically known as a cock-up because I broadcast what should have been this week's show last week and they all went wrong way round. So I'm having to um, broadcast the first part of both Ren and Cochran talking about mermaids and Alice and John and talking about paranormal women today. But what should I do about it? I don't know, John. Young people don't need paranormal women. We've got desperate housewives. You are an idiot. I apologise, ladies and gentlemen, not just for cocking things up and putting the shows the wrong way around, but for having an adopted nephew, who is an idiot. On the Track is a web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. What's in this episode, Mr. John? Well, Hennis, in this week's exciting episode, we have two lovely guests. We have the lovely Ronan Coghlan talking about mermaids in the first of a two-part interview. And we have the lovely Alison Jorlin, who's going to be talking about her project about famous women in the paranormal. Enjoy. I really like the old credits. Ken, I believe you've got some news straight out of Hollywood, haven't you? Oh, Barry! Barry, I have. I, I have indeed. i got some news straight, straight out of Hollywood, and it's a very exciting. What are they doing then? What's this, uh, this new Hollywood film project? They are making a big-budget, live-action Hollywood remake of Murren Butch Stansinger! Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, it's Saturday afternoon 3 and my name's John Downs, I'm the director of the Centre for Fortean Zoology and because it is Saturday afternoon at 3, everything else pales into insignificance beside the fact that we're putting out another episode of On The Track. We put out an episode every Saturday afternoon at 3 for about half an hour and every Wednesday evening at 6.30 for about half that and it's generally about cryptozoology and allied disciplines but it covers hard science, weird shit and what was it again? Archie, peanut, what's the word? Oh, I think it's something to do with currents or sultanas. Or maybe it's something to do with raisins. I can never tell all these different types of dried fruit apart myself. They don't know. They thought it was something to do with cats and raisins. Why? Oh, yeah, probably they thought it was sultanas. But I realise it's surreality. And what's surreality? It's about raisin awareness, currently. And so, with all that frivolity over with, let's get on with our first guest. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first of two episodes featuring this subject, Mr. Ronan Coglan and Mermaids. So, Ronan, now we're back after a slight hiatus, mostly caused by the dog. Um, we're going to talk about mermaids, I believe. We are going to talk about mermaids because I wasn't that pushed about mermaids in days of yore. 
I thought a creature that is half human and half fish is so utterly impossible that there is no point in considering that such things could exist or anything like them. Now, if you look in various books, you will see mermaids explain. Sailors in ships, they will say, which is where sailors ought to be, look out on the ocean and they see dugongs or manatees, and they think at once, that's a mermaid, because after several weeks at sea, their brains have become so warped that they look for beauteous forms and see them in forms that are less than beauteous. But I have come on so many accounts of people who appear to think that mermaids are actually true creatures because they have seen them, that, I, uh, that I'm inclined to think they're telling the truth. They're not making it up most of the time. There may be some people who make such things up. Some tabloids, for example, if, if they want a sensational headline, mermaid scene off Skegness sort of thing. But there are also a great many sincere people who claim to have seen mermaids. But the one objection, I think, is the almost impossible combination of human and fish. It just can't happen, zoologically speaking. Therefore, I was incredulous, but I decided to have a look into the mythology of the mermaid. Well, mermaid mythology goes back quite a bit. In particular, it goes back to a thing in classical mythology called the Triton. Tritons were half human and half dolphin. And this put a little idea into my mind, which I shall expand upon in due course. There have been many sightings of mermaids, but the belief in mermaids has grown up not just in the kind of oceans frequented by manatee and dugong, which tend to be rather warmish oceans, but also in the cold north. Manatees, no self-respecting manatee would come up near to Norway or Greenland. Such Climate is not congenial to manatees, and dugongs also avoid such areas of water. So what inspired the mermaids in the beliefs of those countries? The coasts of Britain also have many stories of mermaids about them. And I just want to take a look at a number of more modern ones. Things that were chronicled in the Middle Ages, one has to take with a pinch of salt sometimes, because some of the chroniclers wrote down things they heard from afar, and the story had traveled in from Germany or somewhere, and it passed from mouth to mouth. It could have got warped in the telling. But with more modern sightings, we might have evidence for the existence, if not of mermaids, at least of something that looked pretty much like mermaids. So I want to take you to Bonnie, Scotland, the land of the Haggis and Billy Connolly. And I want to mention that in 1811, a farmer, saw what he described as a mermaid. It was on the shore, but when it saw the farmer, it entered the water. He estimated that it was between four and five feet in size. Now, usually when people are telling stories they've made up, they're not so precise as to try to give measurements, as though they are scientists trying to evaluate what they've seen. In 1830, a small mermaid 
was washed up on the Scottish shore. I'm just checking where she was washed up. Yes, Ben Becula. Now, when I say a small mermaid, she looked like a child, though she had a developed breast. And she see, according to the record, she was half human and half fish. What is more to the point, the record was kept officially by the sheriff's office because she was dead when she was washed ashore. The story of how she died is a miserable and shameful tale. She was seen in the water and some rotten little boy pelted her with a stone. She disappeared from sight for a while. But a couple of days later, her body was washed up on the shore. The question of how they would bury her weighed heavily with the sheriff, who investigated the matter and examined the body and concluded she was human enough to get human burial. And she is buried up there somewhere in the region of Benbecula. This is actually much more of uh, a convincing mermaid encounter than many because it was officially noted and officially dealt with. But there are many other accounts of mermaids too. I am at present referring to this enlightening book which can be bought at amazon.com whenever you like. And it's well worth it, believe me. And who was it who wrote this book, Rana? We need to know the author. I think I might already have mentioned it in, our, in my last interview, but it is my own literary offspring. I have engendered it, which is quite a difficult thing to do with a book. Yes, as long as you don't misengender it, you'll probably be cancelled then. Mm. Now, just to tell you that Aberdeenshire seemed to be a place that many people believed was sniving with mermaids. The caves there fed by the waters, they were thought to contain mermaids. But there isn't an account of an actual sighting there that I have ever come across. But I want now to go into more southerly waters. Christopher Columbus, a well-known voyager of possibly Italian origin, though it's been disputed, claimed he had seen mermaids and they were very ugly, but what he had seen were almost certainly manatees. He's used by the manatee arguers quite a lot. But the argument, or rather the witness account that is more convincing is that of Robert Foster. Robert Foster was a diver. He lived in Florida, which is a congenial place for diving. And one day when he was diving in the water, he saw something he could not believe. Heading towards him, was what looked like a traditionally described mermaid. Woman to the waist, fishtail and all down below. But she was not a friendly looking mermaid. In fact, she had long fingernails with which she set off towards him. And it was clear from the look of hatred in her eyes that she had every intention of tearing Robert Ford apart. He made a hurried escape, got out of the water, and gave up diving forever. Now, one might say this was a tall tale, but if someone gives up his livelihood because of an experience, this generally means that he hasn't made the experience up unless he's having hallucinations. Always a possibility underwater, but this was a professional diver. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't just somebody who was having a dive just to see what it was like to have a look at the fishes. We will be back with Ronan next week. 
because his stories about mermaids had taken up more room than I had originally envisaged. My fault, not his. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing what happens next. Great. So, Alison, yeah. you're somebody I see nearly every week in the live chat at, um, after the, at, while the show's on during the premiere on Saturdays. And you've been talking about your project, about women in Fortiana. Yes, that's right. Paranormal women. Tell me. Tell me all about it. Okay. Well, uh, you can see what I've done on YouTube at youtube.com slash paranormal women. Uh, but um, it, the way I got interested in it is I, I found out about Catherine Crow, who was really the progenitor of paranormal investigation. And I thought, geez, why didn't I know about her? I mean, she's the one who brought the term poltergeist into English language usage. I should know her name. Really? I and, didn't know that. Yes. <laughs> she was the first. Uh, she was reading she was reading German texts um, in uh, the 1800s. And uh, she was really fascinated. She was English, but uh, she was also fluent in German and French. So she was reading a lot of literature uh, in those languages and was astounded uh, at what she was learning, especially uh, from the German scientists and uh, German uh, researchers who were making extraordinary paranormal discoveries. And so that's how she brought she brought the term poltergeist into English language usage when she decided to write about it in uh, 1848 in her seminal book, The Night Side of Nature. And so she was the first to actually bring that term into usage. And she was reading about things in France and things in Germany. And then she looked around uh, in England to see if you know, she could find evidence of those same type of manifestations and write a book about it. And that's that's what she did. That's fantastic. Yeah. But and so I decided I, I really have to uh, make videos about these extraordinary women. That is a fantastic. It's a fantastic thing that you're doing because it is terribly sexist, but the men are better known than the women. That's just not fair. Because yeah. you have women like Mary Jean Kaufman, who spent 70 years researching the Almasty, and she is, or was, still is now, in history, historical terms, head and shoulders above anybody else who, who researched the man-beasts of what was then the Soviet Union. And... It's not fair that she's she's only half remembered when right. some, when some idiot who rushes around rushes around the countryside going hey there's a squatch in them bare bushes is famous because he's on reality television and it's just not fair, is it? No, and uh, it was actually our mutual friend Richard Freeman who who taught me about uh, Marie Jean, and uh, you know. <laughs> She just died not too long ago. Uh, she was uh, one of those uh, long-lived uh, researchers, um, like Alexander David Neal, for example. That's a, another another woman I've I've researched, and uh, the, you know they both lived to a hundred. So I mean that's really <laughs> extraordinary. Uh, but yeah, the the fact that these people are around so long in the case of those two and and we still don't really fully appreciate the research that they've done so i was really delighted when richard uh told me about about her um just uh in one of my presentations come here um, richard, and say hello oh, <laughs> you just come into the room he's just come into the room he knows we're talking about him his ears must have been burning hello, hi how are you <laughs> In front of the camera. Um, uh, I, I can't lean down. Oh, oh hi. Hello. I've just been feeding axolotls. 
Oh, you have axolotls? Yeah. Yeah, we've had them. Oh, my God, I love them. I used to be a zookeeper years ago. I've looked after all sorts of things, crocodiles, alligators, snakes, lizards, turtles, gorillas, giraffes, elephants, penguins. Me. That's what I love about you guys the most is when I watch your show, you're always like crawling with animals, and (laughs) I'm jealous, and I want to be there. That makes us sound like got some sort of parasites. We're all crawling. No, no, no. I mean the... (laughs) Cute animals crawling. Well, I know what animals. you mean. He's just being <laughs> stupid. <laughs> but uh, uh, axolotls are very cute. <laughs> so, I love the way because mentioning Alexandra David Neal, she's one yes. of my great, great heroes. I think she was fantastic. Yeah. Um, so I've, you know, I'm sometimes called on to give presentations at uh, paranormal conferences around the U.S. And I present on these women, uh, uh, like, a, I think it was 2017 is probably the first uh, presentation I gave. And the presentations are entitled Paranormal Women, A Hidden History. So I, I talk about these women and I was, um, you know, happy to add uh, Kaufman uh, to the list of women um, when I presented at a more cryptozoology geared conference last year. Uh, and so, yes, uh, Alexandra David Neal, I t- I've talked about her a lot. She's She was an amazing researcher. Just to be able to integrate herself into Buddhist culture in countries where you know, there were Buddhist nuns, but they didn't, they weren't given the power, uh, you know, that some of the males were. I mean, even in, in Buddhism, there's there's sexism, unfortunately, but she was able to transcend that and go beyond um, those uh, limitations and learn from some of the masters and be be welcomed uh into the halls of some of these masters uh and you know she's well known for uh tulpas uh, thought forms and generating one of her own thought forms but there's other stories that could be told about her if you actually uh read um her books uh you know magic and mysticism in tibet for example there's a lot in there about levitation and uh, telepathy and other forms of, of psychic skills and psychic sports. <laughs> Agreed. It's a fantastic. It's one of my favorite, favorite 14 books. I have. That's right. So there's, there's a lot that isn't talked about. And it, it just seemed curious to me, you know, why anyone today would want just half of the picture? Why aren't we learning about all uh, all these amazing paranormal researchers, be they male or female? I think everybody should get a complete picture, and that's why I'm developing this YouTube channel uh, to reach a larger audience and teach about these women and some of their extraordinary discoveries. One of the things that I think is most important about what you do is not just that you're telling people about these wonderful women, but it is a sad fact that there are more men than women in cryptozoological research, at least. And what I hope is that a new generation of girls is going to see your channel and be inspired to do it for themselves. And that's what that's the most important thing, I think. I, I agree. I agree. Uh, and if they see that their, their contributions are going to be recognized, then I think they'll do that. I think many more women will be attracted to these fields. And I think um, maybe not so much in cryptozoology, but in Paris a parapsychology, um, in psychical research, in ghost hunting. You know, what I've seen, I've been involved in these fields, uh, you know, for some time and, uh, you know, for about 20 years. And I've seen in terms of, you know, ghost hunting and uh, 
parapsychology research that it, it seems like there are many more females. It seems like there's a larger percentage than males. It's mm. just um, if you watch some of those terrible ghost hunting shows <laughs> that we have uh, both here uh, in the USA and you have some of them in the UK as well. Uh, you see that the males are just overrepresented as if it's like some big macho kind of um, pursuit that uh, us, uh, you know, fainting uh, violets, <laughs> you know, the females, the parasex can't handle the ghosts. And and really, no, their job is to go, ah, what's that? <laughs> oh, my God. And then some big tough bloke comes in to save them. Yes, yes. Well, and, and it's really a farce. We talk about Odette. <laughs> oh, Vicky's just said, have we talked about Odette Churning yet? No. Tell me about tell me about her. Well, the interesting thing about her is that she was a she was half Russian, half French, and naturalized British. She done all sorts of strange things in her life. She'd been a uh, playwright. She'd been an actress. She'd um, been a literary agent. She'd done all sorts of things. And she also wrote three books about Bigfoot. Wow. And when she died, she left an unpublished book. And Richard and I were lucky enough, a couple of years back, that a guy who knew Richard very vaguely bought a load of her papers at auction, including the manuscript of this unpublished book. And it's now been edited, laid out, and it's just now been emailed to Richard for him to write footnotes for, and that's it. So her unpublished book is going to come out very soon. And oh, again, man, I would love to read, read uh, her work. I have not heard about her. She I'll has, send it to you, I promise. I'll send you a copy. She has a there are two or three published books on the Yeti. Mm. She wrote money on the Yeti, not Bigfoot. And yeah. what is <laughs> what is her name again? Odette Chernin, T C H E R N I N E. Um, like Richard said, the books are actually more about the Yeti than Bigfoot, but I've sort of got the habit of using Bigfoot as a sort of synonym for tall, hairy things with big feet. <laughs> right. So kind of an umbrella term, if you will. Well, it is, yes, because in North America, the first person who came up with the the name Bigfoot was actually, I believe, a hoaxer anyway, wasn't he, Richard? Yeah, yeah. What I've always thought about women in cryptozoology is women make up 52% of the world's population. They should be 52% of everything. You know, we. I agree. In Britain, we've had female heads of state, we've had female prime ministers, but we don't have fifty-two percent female cryptozoologists. And that's something I'm. That's one of the things I really would like to change before I finally retire and go off to do whatever I'm going to do, which is probably nothing much. <laughs> Not like Jackie. There's Jackie, of course. Jackie isn't Tonks, it? my friend Jackie Tonks. Um, she came to Russia with me to hunt the Almasty. The oh, Tonga. did she? Yeah, and she, when she was in Northern California, uh, driving along a logging road, she saw two Sasquatch <gasps> run across the road in front of her car, and at the closest, they were 15 feet away, and she said there weren't guys in costumes and masks, because she could see the faces twitching with alarm when they saw the car. They sort of ran out into the middle of the road, dithered in the middle of the road, looked like they were going to run back again, and then carried on and went down this great big slope. Oh man! But I, I need to talk to her about that. Yeah, I'll send. Yeah. I'll send you. Uh, we'll put you in touch with her. Yeah, she's just recovering from an operation. It's not a major yeah. one. But, yeah, um, we're on the we're on the the same um, uh, Facebook chat. So. Yeah. She oh, yes, of course, John, we quite often. And the other one you need to look up is a, a woman called Laura Routon. If you go, oh, on, I, I don't think I've heard of her. If you go onto YouTube, she's got a great channel called The Paranormal Scholar. 
look great look paranormal scholar and she's re really really good i'm gonna check that out definitely if you want to support us and help us make more content like these please press like subscribe follow our facebook page and check out our patreon And there's the ghost of Joe Strummer, who's an ever more regular visitor to my little studio, wants me to remind you, always press the notification bell, or else you won't be told when the next show's going to be. And that would be an awful pity, wouldn't it? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is about it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I want to say a big thank you to my guests this week who have been Richard Freeman, Alison Jornlin and Ronan Coughlin. There is more to come from both Ronan and Alison and of course Richard can think of it because I can't imagine doing on the track for very long without him popping up again. But you're going to have to wait and see what's going to happen next. I want to say a big thank you to Louis, my producer, and to Miss Karen and Miss Judy, who managed to keep my house and my affairs into a certain amount of order. I'm going to be back on Wednesday. What are we going to be talking about on Wednesday? I'm not sure. I was planning to do a book review, but on the other hand, I have various other things I might be talking about, so you're just going to have to wait and see on that one. And next week on Saturday at 3 o'clock I'll be back with the final part of my discussion with Ronan and I haven't decided yet whether to put the next part of my conversation with Alison in or to go off on a complete tangent. So ladies and gentlemen, are you listening Mr McCrinnan? So, ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to be there watching the show, which I very much hope you are, because I really enjoy the live chat on the premieres on Saturday afternoon. It's one of my favourite parts of the week. So, if you're going to be there joining in the live chat, pressing the like button and doing all the other things that you guys are so kind enough to do, as well as watching the show, then I'll be seeing you.